Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and thank you, Candace and the band. You know, sometimes the music is so good, you don't even really need a sermon. Um, but I'm going to preach anyways, so y'all can bear with me. Uh, would you pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful for this time and space that we have uh, to spend in your presence and to study your word. God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit now to open us up. God, help us to hear the word that you have for us today. Help us to hear the words of love and comfort that you always have. But God, also open us to the ways that you are challenging us to grow. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, who is the living word. Amen. Uh, well, normally at the beginning of a sermon, I like to open with like a story or a joke or something to kind of ease us into the topic. Um, but I want to do something different today. I want to start with a confession. And here's kind of the backstory to, to my confession. Um, so at Kindred Church, one thing that's really important to us is inclusivity, right? Inclusivity. Uh, if you go to the Kindred website and you look at the very top of our homepage, one of the first things you're going to see there is our church tagline. Does anybody know what our church tagline is? I don't have any prizes to hand out, but just... We say that we are your inclusive church family, your inclusive church family. It's also at the top of the email newsletter that we send out every single Sunday, your inclusive church family. Uh, when we send out mailers to the local neighborhoods to invite folks to come check us out, when we do ads on Instagram and Google to try to reach new people, we use that same tagline, your inclusive church family. Um, why? Because we want everybody to, to come to us knowing that this is a part of our identity. This is a major part of our theology. Our whole approach to ministry is built around inclusivity. And I know that for some of you, that's like the reason you're here, right? Some of you have told me that you left your last church or maybe you kind of drifted away over time because that church wasn't as inclusive as you think church ought to be. And so you, you come here. Uh, so, some of you, I know, have stuck with us at Kindred Church, even though there's some things about this church that you don't love, you know. Uh, we're still a startup. We don't have all the ministries and resources and programs of a larger established church yet. Um, our seats are not the most comfortable seats. So, some of us worship in the movie theater days, and we got spoiled there. Uh, so sorry about the seats. But you've stuck with us anyways. I know for many of you, because of our commitment to inclusivity. Well, um, as I was working on the sermon this week, uh, it hit me that a lot of times I'm not actually as inclusive as I like to think. And a lot of times I'm not as inclusive as Jesus wants me to be. And don't take this the wrong way. I know it's early in the sermon for me to already be stepping on your toes, uh, but maybe the same is true for you. Maybe you're not always as inclusive as you like to think. Maybe you're not yet as inclusive as Jesus wants you to be. Uh, this morning, I want to explain what I mean by that. And I want us to see what we can do about it. Because the good news is that it might take us stepping outside of our comfort zone a little bit, but we can absolutely become as inclusive as Jesus wants us to be. And as we're going to see here in a minute, the people around us, people in our lives, people that we care about need us. They need us to become as inclusive as Jesus wants us to be. So this is a good thing to think about for ourselves individually. It's also a good thing for us to think about collectively as a church. Today we are wrapping up this sermon series that we've been in. where We've been talking about how we can live into a God-sized vision for our church. If you're with us back on week one of this series, we looked at the Great Commission and we saw that Jesus has this like global, universal, almost like cosmic vision for what he wants his church to be and to do in this world. And in this sermon series, we've been talking about different ways that we can live into that, that God-sized vision to help us be the church Jesus wants us to be. Now, this is a little scary to do as a preacher, but does anybody remember any of the, the ways that we've talked about that we can live into a God-sized vision over the last several weeks? Yes, thank you, somebody, thank you. Yeah, I think that was Sandra. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Service, that's a good way to do it. Any others? Prayer, Prayer. Prayer. yep, thank you. Any others? Yeah, showing up, presence, good. Everyone's favorite? 
Yeah, financial, financial generosity. Yes, excellent. Excellent. You guys got all of them. That's good. I feel better as a, as a preacher. Um, so all of that is great. Those are important ways that we live into the mission of the church. Absolutely. But there's one more thing that we got to do. And, and if we don't do this one last thing, we are never going to be as inclusive as Jesus wants us to be. And we're going to fall short of that God-sized vision that Jesus has for us. Um, now to to, to kind of show you what, what I'm talking about here, uh, we, we need to remember something important about God. And this is something that I know many of us already know this. Uh, many of us would say that we love this about God, but it's something that we often forget, and it's something that's really easy for us to misunderstand. So let me show you what I'm talking about on the slide here. We believe that God is inclusive. God is inclusive. Why do we feel called to be an inclusive church? Because it's cool and it's trendy? No, we, we want to be an inclusive church because God is inclusive. However, however, it's important that we understand God is not inclusive in a passive kind of way. God is not inclusive in the sense that God will welcome people who find their own way to God. God is inclusive in an active way. God takes the initiative. God is active. Somebody say God is active. God is active. Yes, you can do better than that. God is active. God is active. Yes, we should be excited about this. Let, let me uh, show you how Jesus teaches about this. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus says this. He says, suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until, that's a very important word, until he finds it? What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, listen, God is inclusive like that. God is like this shepherd. What, what does the shepherd do? Does he just say like, well, one got away. If he makes his way back, I'll welcome him back into the fold no, that's not what God does. God drops everything. God goes seeking and searching, seeking and searching until that sheep is found and brought back into the fold. God is actively inclusive. In case we miss the point, Jesus follows this up with another parable that makes the exact same point. He says, or what woman, if she owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house searching her home carefully until, there's that word again, until she finds it. Again, Jesus is saying, understand, God is inclusive like that. God doesn't just shrug and say like, oh, well, I hope that coin turns up at some point. No, God goes seeking and searching until that coin is found. Why? Because God is not passively inclusive. God is actively inclusive. And why is that? Why is God actively inclusive? It's because when there is something that you value deeply and that thing is lost or that thing goes missing or you don't have that thing anymore in your possession, you, you don't act passively. You get really, really active. And we know this from our own lives. Like, have you ever lost your car keys? When you lose your car keys, you don't just say like, Oh, well, I hope they turn up at some point. No, your car will not work without those keys. You can't get to work without those keys. You can't get to Chick-fil-A without those keys. You need those keys, right? And so what do you do? You dig through your purse. You might dump it all out. You start pulling out couch cushions if you have to. You, you might get to the Apple store and buy an AirTag so that it never happens to you again, right? Because those keys are valuable. You need to get those keys back, and you know it. Uh, a couple years ago, Actually, it's been several years ago now, but um, one day my wife, Kirsten, uh, she looked down at her hand and she noticed that the prong of her engagement ring had come loose and actually one of the diamonds in the ring had fallen out. Now, when we realized that this diamond was missing, we did not just say, oh, well, I hope that diamond shows up at some point. No, that diamond is valuable. I spent a lot of money, especially at that time, on that diamond and it's like the symbol of our love. So we didn't just shrug it off. We got on the floor. We're looking around. We're digging through the laundry. At one point, I think I was digging through the dustbin of our vacuum cleaner. We actually miraculously did eventually find the diamond. Um, so grateful for that. We, we searched until, until we found it, right? Let me give you one last example. And this one is probably the most, like, theologically accurate example. 
Um, last summer, our family went on vacation to the beach, and it was the 4th of July week, and so everybody else was at the beach too. It was pretty crowded. But one day we were out there, and we kind of staked out our own spot. You know, we like spread our towels out, the like universal sign for like don't encroach other people. We had our own space. We're chilling out, and all of a sudden, I look up, and this man is just sprinting down the beach, like sprinting. And it was clear that he was not just sprinting for exercise because I could hear he was screaming something over and over and over again. He's screaming. And as he gets closer, I see he's got this panicked look in his face and his eyes are darting all over the place. And he's like, his head's on a swivel. He's looking all around. And as he got a little closer, I I finally heard what it was he was screaming. He was saying, William, William, William. Come to find out his three-year-old son had gone missing. And he was desperately trying to to find a son and get him back. Parents, if you have ever lost your child, like even for a moment, you know that is one of the scariest feelings you can have in this life. Now, fortunately, about 20 minutes later, they found little William, and actually, it ended up being harmless. He had just, he kind of wandered off and started playing with this group of other kids, and he just sort of was hiding in plain sight, and because of the wind and the waves, he, he didn't hear everybody calling his name. So he was fine, but I think about that father. When he found out that his son was missing, Did he just go, oh, well, I hope William comes back. I'll give him a big hug if he ever shows up. No! He got up out of his chair, and he used every cell in his body to get his son back. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus wants us to understand God is inclusive like that, right? Why? Because every single person in this world is valuable to God. Every single person in this world is a child of God. All of us are William in God's eyes. So is God passive? Does God sit back? No, God is active. God is actively inclusive. God wants to include more and more and more and more and more of us into the family of God where we belong. Now that's what God is like. That's how God is inclusive. What what does that have to do with you and me and with Kindred Church. Well, check out what happens in Acts chapter 1, this passage that Jason read for us a minute ago. At this point, uh, Jesus has died on the cross. Jesus has risen on Easter. He's now spent about 40 days after Easter with his disciples, and he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven. And do you remember the very last thing that Jesus said to his disciples in this moment? If you were with us at the beginning of this sermon series, we looked at the Great Commission. And in Matthew's gospel, that's the very last thing that Jesus says to the disciples. Uh, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, uh, he tells us the, the story, very similar but slightly different wording. Here's how Luke puts it. Jesus says to the disciples in this climactic moment, he says, you, talking to his disciples, but, but also by extension talking to us, right? He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my, what? Yeah, you will be my witnesses. That means like, you'll you'll, you'll be my messengers. You'll be my representatives. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, that's like the surrounding region where they were, and all the way to the end of the earth, Jesus says. What's Jesus doing here? He's saying, okay, disciples, okay, church, now it's your turn. It's your turn. I've come to you. I've shown you what God is like. I've shown you God is the the seeking shepherd. God is this divine searching woman. God is actively inclusive. And now I'm going to fill you with my Holy Spirit. And you know what? The Spirit is going to lead you and guide you. The Spirit is going to give you opportunities. The Spirit's going to give you words. The Spirit's going to give you courage so that you can go into the world and so that you can be actively inclusive with me so that you can go out and invite more and more people into this family that we call the church. And what happened? Well, 10 days later, it was the day of Pentecost. As I mentioned earlier in the service, today is this annual celebration of Pentecost. 2,000 years later, we still celebrate this every year in the life of the church because it was so significant. The disciples were gathered together. You can imagine this. They're in this upstairs room 
in the city of Jerusalem. And they start worshiping together, just, just like we're doing right now. They start worshiping. And as they worship, just like Jesus promised, Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them, what was that like? Some of the people there said, well, it was like this, it was like this fire that came down as we were worshiping. And it was like this, that this fire was burning in our hearts. I wonder, have you ever had an experience where you were worshiping and you just felt the love of God like burning in your heart? Not like heartburn, like you had eaten a greasy meal and you need some toast, but like in a good way, like the love of God was just burning in your heart. Maybe, maybe you've had that experience. Other people that were in the room that day said that the spirit was like this mighty rushing wind. It was like this wind that was just like pushing the disciples out into the world. And what did the disciples do when they were full of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember? Did, did, they, did they go outside and they put a, a sign out front of the building that said, all are welcome, and then they just like passively waited for people to come to them? No, that's not what they did. They knew that would be way too passive. Did they get on their church website and say, your inclusive church family, and then just wait for people to come to them? No, no, that would be way too passive. They did exactly what Jesus had modeled for them and called them to do. By the power of the Spirit, they went out into the world, and they started actively including people. They started actively inviting people into this family of God that we call the church. And you know what happened? A lot of people said no, <laughs> because if you have any experience inviting people to church, a lot of times people say no, that's just a part of it. But guess what? A lot, a lot of people said yes. Luke tells us that on that, on that first Pentecost, that 3,000 people that day said yes to Jesus. They said yes to church. They got baptized, and their lives were forever changed, and the mission of the church was born. This same mission that we're still a part of 2,000 years later. Why did that happen? It happened because those disciples refused to settle for just being passively inclusive, that they knew that there was more that Jesus had called them to do than simply sit there and be welcoming. They were active, they were active, they were active. Now, what does that have to do with you and with me? Think about this. This is really amazing. That, that same Holy Spirit that Jesus poured out on the church on Pentecost, that same Holy Spirit has been poured out on you and on me did you know the Apostle Paul, he tells us that each one of us, we are temples of the Holy Spirit? Somebody say, I'm a temple. No, that was so weak. Come on, come on. Somebody say, I'm a temple. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that. And guess what? This same calling that Jesus gave to those disciples to be actively inclusive, Jesus has given that same calling to you and to me to go out into the world and not to be passive, but to actively invite more people into this family that we call the church. Now, I know as soon as I say that, and maybe this is why some of y'all are shy about speaking up, as soon as I say that, uh, so some of us get uncomfortable, right? Some of you may be thinking like, okay, Daniel, uh, I like church as much as the next guy, but... Like, I'm just not the kind of person that invites people to church. And I, I totally hear that. I um, grew up in a mainline church tradition. And some of you may share this background with me. In the kind of the mainline church tradition, uh, you're, you're not often taught to invite people to church. In fact, a lot of times you're kind of like discouraged from inviting people to church because it's like, that sounds manipulative. That sounds like obnoxious or aggressive. Like, so we just, we don't want to do that. Uh, others of you, you may be coming from uh, more of an evangelical church background, and maybe you were absolutely taught to invite people to church, but you were taught to do it in ways that are like manipulative and obnoxious, <laughs> right? And so for one reason or the other, maybe you've just kind of decided like, ah, I'm just not the kind of person that invites people to church. I, I hear that. I really do. Um, but, but I also hear Jesus saying to us, yeah, don't do this in ways that are manipulative and obnoxious. Like... That's not the calling here. The calling is for us simply to, to pay attention as we go through our lives, to pay attention to the people around us at work, at home, at school, in the neighborhood. Why do we need to pay attention? Because sooner or later, we're going to run into some people who have a need that Jesus can meet, right? Sooner or later, we're going to run into some people who have a need that the church 
can meet, sooner or later we're going to run into somebody who is really, really discouraged. Or we're going to run into somebody who is really struggling in their sense of self-worth. And you know what they need? They need to know about the unconditional love of God. They, they need that, right? Sooner or later we're going to run into somebody who is new to the area. And they don't really know anybody here yet. Or somebody who's going through a major life transition. They just made a big career change or they just graduated. Or we're going to run into somebody who's lonely. And you know what those people need? They need a supportive faith community in their life. Or sooner or later, we're going to run into somebody who's going through a really hard time, right? Somebody who's going through a divorce. Somebody who is struggling in their parenting, Somebody who has got financial challenges that they're dealing with. Somebody who's struggling with their mental health and you know what they need? They need hope, right? That They need a community to tell them and to remind them that, hey, through Jesus Christ, God is never going to let that struggle be the last word for you. But we're going to run into these people and our calling is simply to pay attention. I think Jesus wants us when we, we see people in any of these categories to just, to just trust that maybe, just maybe... That's an opportunity from the Holy Spirit to to simply extend an invitation, not to be manipulative or obnoxious or aggressive, but just a simple invitation like, hey, no pressure, but one thing that's been really helpful to me in my life has been getting involved with my church. And I don't know if that's something you're into, but if you ever want to come with me to church, I I would love to introduce you to some folks and show you around. It can be that simple. If you are nice about it, Nobody's going to be offended by that, right? Like, how dare you care about me? People don't get mad about that. They don't. They might say no. They might say no thank you, but that's okay. That's okay. We're tough, right? We can move on. No big deal. But you know what? They might say, yeah, you know, that that actually sounds like something I need in my life. They might say, yeah, you know, actually that that sounds like something I should try. They might say, you know, I've actually been thinking about church. And you just, you never know how the Holy Spirit might use your invitation. Did you know, I've told you guys this before, but I want to remind you, they've done studies on this, and what they've found is that uh, Americans who don't go to church, the majority of them say that they absolutely would go to church if they could just go with a trusted friend. There are literally millions of people out there who would go to church. Many of them know that they need church in their life. They just don't want to have to walk into a scary place like this all by themselves. The Holy Spirit wants to use your invitations and my invitations. The harvest is ripe, to paraphrase Jesus, right? And we get to be the ones to extend those invitations. One one last point I want to make about this. Did you know that just by extending an invitation to somebody to church, do you know what you're doing? Whether that person says yes or no, I mean, you can't control what they say. That's, That's not your place. But just by extending that invitation, you are embodying the love of that divine seeking shepherd. Do you know that? Just by extending the invitation, you're embodying the love of that divine searching woman. You are being as inclusive as Jesus wants you to be. So for that reason, after um, worship today, on the way out, we're going to have a couple volunteers, and they're going to be handing out invite cards to Kindred Church, just simple invite cards to our church. Here's what I would love for you to do. You don't have to do this. It's a free country. You can do whatever you want. But I would love for you to take one of those cards, and I would love for you to put it somewhere where you will see it, whether that's your refrigerator at home, on the mirror in your bathroom, uh, in your car, in your office, whatever. Put it somewhere where you will see it and let that be a reminder to you that you are called by Jesus and you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to extend invitations when you have opportunities. If you're the kind of person that you want to actually hand somebody something physical as you invite them to church, feel free to give that card away. We're going to start keeping extras of these at the Connect table every single week so you can always pick up an invite card if if there's somebody on your heart that you want to invite. But at the very least, take that card and keep it as a a reminder of your calling. Um, I, I know I can, like, teach on this. I can theologize about this, and still I know that for many of us, maybe most of us, that this is a little outside of our our comfort zone. But before you dismiss this as like, this is a sermon for somebody else, not for me, um, just think with me about the alternative, right? Like, like if we all decide, I'm just not the kind of person that invites people to church, you know what's going to happen? 
we're going to become an inward-facing church. And I do not want to be part of an inward-facing church because that's boring and it's also unfaithful to Jesus. And, and so let's not settle for, for being passively inclusive, right? Let, let, let's not settle for turning inward. Let's not settle for putting your inclusive church family on our website and thinking that our work here is done. But let's be active. Let's be active like God is active, like Jesus is active, like the Spirit is active. And, and if we can extend invitations when we have opportunities, the Spirit is going to use us in powerful powerful ways. That's the story for some of you sitting here. I don't want to call anybody out or name names, but some of y'all are sitting here right now because somebody had the courage to, to reach out to you with an invitation, and now you're here, a part of our church family, and we're so, so glad for that. Now, to kind of wrap up this series and just to, to kind of put a bow on, on what we've talked about, if we can continue to engage actively in this church together, guys, if we can, if we can pray for our church, if we can show up, if we can uh, give financially to support the mission of the church as we're able, if we can find ways to serve and, and invite others, you know what? I promise you, Kindred Church will never be boring. It will never be boring. Because if we all are invested in all of these ways, the impact that we're going to have on each other is going to be amazing. The impact that this group of people could have in the community, in the world, it's, it's just amazing to think about. And, and if we can do those things, we're going to be living in to this God-sized vision that Jesus has for us. And that's exactly, that's exactly, that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. Let me pray for us. Oh, God, we thank you for who you are, that you are this seeking shepherd. God, each and every one of us at one time or another is that lost sheep. We wander away from you, Lord, in countless ways, and we're so grateful that you don't just shrug that off, that you don't just passively wait for us to find you, but you seek us out and you find us, God. Uh, help us to, to not let your love stop there. God, help us to not receive this seeking, searching love and, and just take it for granted, but help us to be a part of the movement of this love in the world. God, we, we know that there are so many others around us that you would just love to be part of a church family, Lord. Uh, help us to, to keep an eye out for those divine opportunities. And when we have them, God, give us the courage to extend an invitation in whatever form that looks like. God, we thank you that we get to be a part of this movement that we get to be a part of spreading your love in the world, Lord. Uh, it's such a blessing. We pray that you would empower us in this mission as, as we seek to live into your vision, your vision of who our church is called to be. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.